Okay. Call to order Board of Education regular meeting for May 19, 2021 at 6 p.m. for Pleasantdale School District 107. Mr. Bracca? Yes. Mrs. Lenzen? Here. Mrs. Marchion? Here. Mr. Negram? Mrs. Walters? Here. Mr. Zona? Here. Mrs. Cabana? Here. Okay, so our first order of business is to recite the Pledge of Allegiance, and I'll turn it over to Dave. Great, thanks so much. So tonight we do have a pledge sayer. I think this is the first mm -hmm. pledge sayer that we've had this year, so this is super, super exciting for us. And we did limit it to one pledge sayer just to be able to maintain social distancing and things like that. But tonight we have Ayan Ayanov, who has worked for the past four years to make Pleasantdale Middle School a greener place. Uh, he has advocated for the removal of straws from the cafeteria, helped the Principal's Environmental Action Team, or PEAT, earn their Earth flag this year, and co-wrote two grants with Mr. Sontag that were approved for a one kilowatt per hour solar panel that will be installed this summer. Ivan is definitely an inspired learner and has made a huge impact on our entire Pleasant Oak community during his time as a student here. So let's do a round of applause for him. <laughs> And then let's have Ivan come up and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. That's great. Whenever you're ready. I pledge, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Great job. Mr. All right. Okay, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Pelton to tell us about our brag board. All right, so this month, uh, our brag boards are decorated with work from our first grade remote students in Miss Banky's class. Her class has been reading books from the Fly Guy series. The Fly Guy series of books follows a look, the learning adventures of the main character, Fly Guy. Kids are drawn to Fly Guy books because they're packed with humor, eye-catching photography and illustrations, and action. Our first graders created stories with insects as their main character. They also drew their very own Fly Guy pictures. Please take some time to check out this great work. Very nice. Okay, so we'll move on to item four, open forum. Please know that all individuals addressing the board will be afforded three minutes. We will also limit to 15 minutes on any one topic and we'll take the green forums in the order they came. The green forums are out in the hallway if you have a question, we will acknowledge all who have completed the green forms in the minutes of this meeting. Any questions addressed to the board will be answered by the administration within 48 hours. Additionally, for clarification and to ensure that your specific questions are answered, we request that the questions be submitted in writing on those green forms on the table outside the board. Is there anybody who would like to address the board at this time? Okay, so we don't have anyone, so we'll go ahead and move on to consent agenda. Okay. So before we um, jump into the consent, if it's okay, um, there was one item, the uh, item E, settlement agreement with a former student. We have not received that settlement agreement yet. If they're still working that through, we expect to have it for the June meeting, and it'll be on the June consent agenda. So um, you can strike that from your agenda, and if approved, the uh, consent agenda would be approved as amended. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. It's a Item 5A, approve regular meeting minutes of April 21st, 2021. Um, does anybody have any questions on the minutes from April? No? Okay. Item 5B, approve closed session minutes of April 21st, 2021. Item 5C, approve special meeting minutes of April 28th, 2021. Mm -hmm. Item 5D, approve payment of April payroll May warrants. Um, this month, David Negron represented the board in discussions with Frank Adams, but in their absence, um, I'm going to go ahead and ask Dave if we had any questions on the bills. There were no questions on the bills. Okay, okay. great. Does anybody else have any questions on the April payroll May warrant list? Okay. Item 5E, settlement agreement with... That one's stricken. Okay, so I don't have to read it. Okay. Item 5F, approved food service contract and hot lunch fees. Item 5G, approve cleaning services. Item 5H, approve the FY22 parent student handbook. Okay. So can I have a recommend? Yeah, uh, personnel report. Oh, personnel report, okay. Can I have a recommendation that the Board of Education approve the consent agenda as modified? So moved. Can I have a? So oh. moved, yeah. Yep. Second. Mrs. Lenzen? Yes. 
This is Marcion. Yes. Mrs. Walters. Yes. Mr. Zona. Yes. Mr. Bracca. Yes. Mrs. Cabana. Yes. Okay, so the motion is passed. We'll move on to item six, informational updates, and I'll turn this over to Dr. Prasad. Great, thank you. So um, the first one is just an update, a standing update that we've had this year on our, on our instructional model. Um, it's a little bit long this, this time around, so I apologize. It's mm -hmm. a longer than usual, but I want to talk about how we're closing up this year and then what we're expecting for next year. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're excited about finishing the last couple of weeks strong. To that end, our schools are gearing up for some amazing end of the year activities, including our fourth and eighth grade clap outs, field day at the elementary school, and a graduation at middle school. Additionally, our eighth graders will have some amazing end of the year activities, um, which include a Chicago boat tour, um, a class trip to Six Flags Great America, and a day a local teams course, uh, team building course rather. Uh, these experiences replace the eighth grade class trip to Cedar Point Amusement Park. Uh, these will be some great experiences for our students and I know they're looking forward to them. As you know, there's been a great deal of new guidance released by local, state, and federal agencies. Since our last board meeting, the FDA has provided emergency approval of Pfizer's two-shot COVID vaccine for children 12 and older. Our district, along with Lyons Township High School and the other elementary associate districts, have coordinated to offer a community-wide vaccination clinic at LTHS South Campus on May 24th for the first dose and June 14th for the second. Again, this is a vaccination opportunity that's open to any, communi any community member ages 12 and up. Last week, the CDC announced that masking is no longer required indoors or outdoors for individuals that are fully vaccinated. This is exciting news and a sign that the end of the pandemic is near. However, the district will need to continue its masking practices as the new regulations stipulate that K-12 schools should continue to follow masking protocols. As we look ahead to next school year, we will continue to follow guidance and the direction of IDPH, Illinois Department of Public Health, the Cook County Department of Public Health, and the Illinois State Board of Education. As we look ahead to next year, we expect schools to run in, the, in as normal a manner as possible. We've discovered that our students learn best when they are at school with their teachers and peers. Additionally, we know that our community supports children being in school as 95% of our students are currently learning in person. With that said, we plan to follow current state the current guidance by the State Board of Education and offer an at-home option for students who have a documented medical need to learn from home or have a family member that has a documented medical condition that prohibits the child from learning at school. It is our intention to work with these families individually and develop a plan that meets the needs of their children to ensure the safest learning environment possible. I know parents are wondering what school will look like next year and it's my intention to send an email to parents explaining what we have planned and that we have a normal 2021-2020 school year planned for next year. Um, this will also give parents an opportunity to discuss an at-home option for their child if they qualify. If we've learned anything this year, it's that we need to be adaptable and flexible and therefore, and therefore we'll continue to watch the metrics and make decisions in the best interest of our students and community. And that was a lot and I would love to answer your questions and I'm sure you would want to. Um, I have a few. Okay, yep. start. So um, first, sorry, what, what vaccine is it for the 12 year olds? Pfizer. So that's the two. What was the first date? The 24th, May 24th, 2nd of June 14th. So the second one, just because with the teachers we accommodated those potential side effects, so but that won't, won't be... The, the side effect on the second won't be an issue because it's well, during yeah, the school. summer. Um, we've talked as an administrative team and our goal is to make getting the vaccine as frictionless as possible for Got our it. families. So okay. if that means making adjustments to attendance, okay. making sure that kids have, uh, you, know, you know, increasing deadlines for kids if they've got things due, we'll, sure. we're going to do everything we can to make sure that families are able to get their kids vaccinated and not just our clinic, any, anywhere they choose sure. to get their child vaccinated. Okay, perfect. Second question was, um, no, I can put, oh, if parents, so next year it'll be like case by case basis in terms of parents that want to keep students remotely, who would they reach out to, to so start that So the email that I have prepared to go out is really as soon as it's morning, so sure. probably tomorrow or Friday, um, stipulates that they should contact their principal okay. and then as an admit, the principals will bring that to our admin team and we'll, you know, with the kind of wisdom of the team, we'll, we'll put together a plan for those kids. Perfect. Okay. Mm -hmm. Those are Great. Questions. Great questions. So I have a question. So the documented medical 
illnesses that would include like quarantine if someone has to be great quarantined question. for two great weeks question so weeks. yeah so we we are also working on a plan for students that may need to quarantine realizing there may be uh, an, uptick, an uptick in short-term absences from school. Um, I don't have the details of that yet, but I'm confident that we'll have a great plan in place for that. Um, as far as what documentation is gonna be required, we know it's a medical note. We don't know what the extent of, like we don't know what uh, medical conditions qualify and what don't qualify. You know what I mean? But there's still a lot of unknowns in that area. So um, I'm assuming that I'm sure that IDPH, uh, the Cook County Department of Public mm -hmm. Health, and ISB are going to come out with guidance on that shortly. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. okay, any other questions? All right. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you. So let's go ahead and move on to item seven administrative reports. Oh, uh, we've got, I still have two other updates. I oh, I'm yeah, sorry. sorry. <laughs> you um, so it, our, <laughs> no, your time's off. Right. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> our other standing <laughs> item is our um, COVID, dis, uh, COVID district COVID dashboard, and we continue to monitor the COVID metrics in our schools and community. While the positivity rates in our community and state continue to drop, we are seeing an uptick in positive cases within our schools. Um, while none of the cases can be attributed to in-school transmission, the upward trend needs to be monitored carefully uh, and is another reason to continue our safety protocols. Over the past two weeks, we've had six positive cases uh, and that, that have been reported to the district. Additionally, we have 45 individuals serving, uh, observing, not serving, <laughs> observing a school mandated quarantine. Um, we have been closely monitoring the positivity rates in our uh, three regions that we monitor. The positivity rate uh, in our three Pleasantdale zip codes is 2.52, which is going to be different than what you're going to see on the dashboard because these are numbers as of today. Those are numbers as of last Friday. Friday. Correct. Mm -hmm. um, the positivity rate in the Lyons Township High School attendance area is 2.98. And finally, the positivity rate in the West Cook suburban area is, it's actually 3.5. I have 4.4 written down here, but it's 3.5. I checked it just before we came down. Uh, we'll continue to closely monitor both our in-school and community metrics throughout the remainder of the school year, which is nine days. We're almost there. We're almost there. We're almost there. Um, so, Erica, if you can um, go scroll the other way, go up. This is where we usually like to start. So, again, these are the overall numbers mm -hmm. for the district. Um, we have three this, you know, currently three, but we've had six over the last couple of weeks, which is which is a, a large number for us, to be honest with you. We've gone several weeks in a row with zero yeah. um, or one, but mostly, you know, we've gone. You know, these aren't as high as we saw in October and November, but they're definitely higher than we've seen in the last, you know, month or so. So again, I think, you know, people are starting to relax, and like that, like I said, that transmission is happening outside of school, so I think people are starting to relax, they're getting into summer activities, they're, mm -hmm. you know, taking masks off, things like that, and our kids still aren't vaccinated, many of our adults are, but kids still aren't, so uh, I think that is what we can attribute to. Any other? Pretty standard. Okay. Um, so then I've got one more um, informational item, and I am super excited about this one. So and I, I even start my first sentence. I tell you I'm excited. <laughs> I'm excited to introduce to our board the next Director of Student Services. The Director of Student Services oversees programming for our English language learners, supports our early childhood program, and heads the special education program. To identify our next director, we underwent a rigorous administra our rigorous administrator interview process. This process begins with a paper screening of all candidates who apply. This paper screening process identifies candidates who have relevant experience and have performed well in academic settings. The next phase is an administrative screening interview. The admin team interviews a variety of candidates looking for those that would be the best fit for our community. The third phase is a community interview. Uh, which include committees of teachers, parents, and students. This phase also requires candidates to complete a writing sample. The final part of the process requires administration to complete a thorough reference check. Through this process, one candidate rose to the top, Beth Parker. Ms. Parker has worked in just about every position in the area of special education from early childhood to special education teacher to director. Currently, she is a pupil services administrator in Hinsdale School District 181. I am confident that Ms. Parker will do an amazing job serving our students, 
She will begin her role, her role on July 1, and at this point, I'd like to turn it over to her to say a few words to the board. So Beth, I'll turn it over to you. And just come right up to that podium there. All right. I'm normally pretty loud. Masks kind of muffle. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, a pleasure to meet all of you I haven't met before. Um, I'm excited to work for the community. Um, as uh, Dave shared, I have a variety of experiences, which I feel match some of the goals in the district. Um, part for me was to find a match for myself and through the process, the rigorous process, the interview process of meeting the administration team, the students, parents, and staff, I felt this was also a good match for me. So I'm excited to join you in July 1 and I've already begun my transition process with the current director and I just look forward to um, getting to know you better. Thank you. All right. We're really excited to have you on board. We've heard so many good things. Oh, thank you. Now I can. Now you <laughs> Okay, so moving on to item seven, administrative reports. All right. Summer is a great time for teachers to sharpen their professional skills. Each year, our teachers engage in professional learning and curricular projects. Tonight, Dr. Jennifer Band is here to give the board an update on the professional work that will take place this summer. Dr. Band, I'll turn it over to you. Um, and I'm also going to share a little bit about what we did this school year as well. Um, so, oh, I have to uh, so our professional development program is centered around our three strategic blueprint goals, building learning capacity, building learning environments, and building human capital. And so we try to make sure that everything that we do in terms of professional development is aligned with one of those action steps um, in one of those three categories. So some of the action steps we addressed during this year, and this report's a little different because you know we had like a little bit of a weird year. Um, some of the things we addressed are from this year's action steps. Some that we'll address this summer through PD are gonna be for next year, so I kinda combined everything for you. Um, one of the ones we started working on last year and will continue to work on this year is to develop and implement that kindergarten through eighth grade technology skills scope and sequence um, under uh, building learning capacity, so that's what the LC is for. Um, developing a district-wide understanding of the philosophy of differentiated instruction for teachers and staff and begin to implement strategies that enhance differentiated instruction in classrooms. That's under building learning capacity and that was an action step from last year um, or from this current year and we um, kicked that off in 2021. And then an action step that's coming up is teachers will employ strategies to differentiate by process, product, and content in at least one unit per trimester. So that's next year's action step that we'll start addressing right now. Um, provide teachers relevant professional learning aligned to district goals through differentiated pathways allowing for individual choice. So as you'll see in my report this evening, um, that was the entire focus of our year in terms of professional development for our staff under building learning environments. Um, next year's is over the course of the year build and deploy an individualized professional development system. By the end of the year, each teacher will have selected and completed one pathway of his or her choosing. And then finally, um, and I'm really excited about this one because our summer PD really focuses on this, it's a next year one. Um, integrate our technology systems to enhance homeschool communication and provide a streamlined user experience for teachers and families. And really we should have students in there too because that's what we're going to be providing for our students for the upcoming school year. Um, this is just a little bit of a review and not something that we worked on this year just because of pandemic world. Um, but since so many of you are new, I kind of wanted to take you through some of the mainstays we have in professional development. One is our mentoring program. And so every year we train teachers to be mentors through our partnership with Northwestern University. Um, in 2020, so I had to like go back, it seems like a long time ago, but right before the pandemic hit, we actually had our mentoring training and we trained 10 new teacher mentors. So we actually have a group of about 20, 25 teachers across the district who are now trained in our specific mentoring program. So Dr. Allison Gordon from Northwestern uh, leads that training and then Dave and I work with the mentors as well. And then the other um, piece that we kicked off last year, uh, literally two days before the pandemic start was, started, was our Pleasantdale Leadership Institute. So that's in partnership with Northwestern as well. 
and Dr. Timothy Dorer, who runs the um, Master's in Teacher Leadership Program at Northwestern University, and I worked on um, 10 leadership models for our teachers who are in positions of leadership. Um, what we did before <laughs> last March was meant to be a pilot where we were going to evaluate all of the modules and then make adjustments and then start training all of our teacher leaders going into this current year. Obviously, we decided that was not the best use of our time and resources, um, but it was best spent somewhere else. So um, this, uh, this year, Dr. Dora and I are going to work on creating these modules to be delivered in a virtual format so teachers can go through them in a self-paced way, and then we'll have meetings with them throughout the year to reflect and review and kind of uh, like talk about what they've learned in each of those modules. So I think that's the model we're going to use for next year, so that's our plan to start building that program. Jeff, while you're talking about the, yeah. the NU partnership, and I think Jennifer's a bit modest because through her work with um, Dr. Dorr uh, at, at Northwestern, she's been offered an adjunct professorship at Northwestern. <laughs> what? So no, they, they, no they we just did a summer course. Re re recognize the, the just greatness that is Jennifer Vance. So, <laughs> you can but, only take it if you don't leave it. Just, <laughs> no, no. Well, yeah, I that was my nice yeah. 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 You're not going anywhere. Right. <laughs> It's, a, it's to teach a summer course. But that's um, amazing. Have, we no, don't even have great. enough enrollment for the summer course to go, so I'm technically not teaching. Well, yeah, but so. still, that's wonderful. Well, thank right. you. Just take the credit. Right. <laughs> <laughs> say thank you. Yes, I'm supposed to learn how to do that. Um, thank you. Uh, so some highlights from this year's professional development. So I'm, I'm going to give a little credit to, to um, our innovative teaching coach, Megan Vavalka, and our librarian, Ricky Steinmetz because they really helped me. Like, I'm the ideas person, and they're the two that make it happen. And um, we really made some great things happen in professional development this year for our teachers. So in October, our Institute Day focused mostly on digital tools. We really assessed what are the needs, the immediate needs that we have right now for our teachers, and that obviously was one of them. Um, so we offered sessions that were either live on Zoom, or self-paced, so all of the sessions were also recorded, so if teachers wanted to focus on one tool, they could go to that live session, but they could also attend, they could look at the self-paced sessions later on, or they could even repeat the session they were in by going to that self-paced session again, because sometimes it's good to learn things twice or three times, what have you. The three tools we put a major focus on, which you might have seen throughout this year with your children, um, Pair Deck, Class Kick, and Flipgrid. If you click on that Institute menu, um, the way we delivered that was through a menu of options. So we uh, implemented this menu format for all of our Institute days um, where we give teachers choice. So we have our appetizers that is a must do for everyone. Um, our entrees where you can pick one or more than one. Um, what we called our sides. So for the whole year, we picked a cybersecurity for educators course, which was digital, and a digital citizenship course. And we said, by the end of the year, you need to complete both of these. So all of our institute days and release days, they had the opportunity to complete those two. Um, for desserts, we uh, grabbed a collection of podcasts. So we had um, some small tasting portions of desserts with a 10 minute podcast and then like a big dessert which was like an hour long podcast so we had a variety um, so you could kind of pick what works best for you and then the beverages you could work on these throughout the day apple teacher gcn trainings a choice board watching a webinar or they could design their own um, to the presentation um, so for november Oh, I have to click. Sorry. Wait, where did it go? Oh, I went backwards. Okay. So for November, we did an EdCamp format. So this was a professional development day that we added from our remote learning planning days. And this one was really to prepare for second trimester, um, adding time to the day, and starting to change up our instructional model. We had kids coming back from remote, so we had to work on that as well. Um, and an EdCamp format is um, basically informational sessions that are requested by teachers and planned by teachers and they're more inform informal learning opportunities. So we surveyed our staff and said, what do you want to learn? We collected all of the things that they wanted to learn and then we found people to lead and be camp counselors at the ed camp sessions. And so teachers got to choose and go to as many or as few as they wanted to. Um, so can you click on that one? 
we created a Padlet. And it's coming. So um, if you slide down a little bit, um, we created a Padlet and gave them session times. And they could go to whatever sessions that they wanted to. And they could drop in and drop out. Um, depending on, you know, if you went to one, you're like, okay, I got my 10 minutes of what I needed from this. I can go to another one now, or I can do something else. So, and we also gave a lot of time to apply what they had learned as well. So we have all of these sort of self-care and ed puzzle and synchronous teaching and online gaming platforms. And so it's not only a chance for our staff members who have something they want to share with their colleagues, but for our, our teachers to learn from each other. Um, so we had really great feedback on that day, and we had a whole like, camp theme. And then finally, in January, that was our focus on differentiated instruction. So it started off with, um, I did an overview of what is the philosophy of differentiated instruction for all of our teachers. And then we had them pick, and we had them self-assess and pick an area they wanted to focus on most, whether it was process, product, or content. And we uh, gave them some time to do some research and gave them the resources to use for research and they would research the area they wanted to focus most on. And then we did um, some training sessions on each of those areas. And they were able to share the ideas that they had and the things that they wanted to do within either process, product, or content. So if you click on the menu link, you're gonna have to apply tabs to close when I'm done. Um, so we did the everyone, again, we used the menu format with the everyone must do, um, another everyone must do with the research, they picked one, and we did it in an ed camp format, so we could all kind of learn from each other after they did their research. Um, again, cybersecurity or digital citizenship. And then we collected all of these resources for desserts that were related to the three areas of differentiated instruction. And so they could go and look at a bunch of different um, activities. They could go look at a bunch of different assessments. They could read articles. They could listen to podcasts. They could go to different websites. And then they had their uh, things that they could work on throughout the day as well. We had a Padlet for that one as well. Um, one of the cool things we did with these institute days is we designed them not only to include a lot of teacher choice and give them time to implement what they had learned, but we also used the tools that we wanted them to use to deliver the professional development. So we used Google Forms to get feedback. We used Padlets to show them how to use, like to organize the sessions that they were going to. We used Canva to design the menus. Um, we used Flipgrid to get feedback from them. So we were trying to also model a lot of the tools that we wanted our teachers to use as well. So for this summer, <coughs> Um, our focus is going to be on that last strategic blueprint goal that I described about communication and effectiveness and efficiency of our systems. Um, so we are offering some pretty in-depth sessions on Seesaw and Schoology, Seesaw for the elementary, Schoology for the middle school. And each um, session is what, there are three sessions for each, they are each an hour long, and they have um, a focus of uh, personalizing your platform, creating activities, and um, creating assignments and communication on Seesaw. And then for Schoology, um, creating, personalizing, <laughs> creating activities and assessments on Schoology. So we are exploring in Schoology um, a way to use the gradebook on Schoology more efficiently. We're hoping to get teachers out of Skyward and exclusively into Schoology for grading and assignments. Schoology is really used properly, a wonderful tool, not only for students, but for teachers and for parents. And so we're really trying to beef up our training this summer in preparation for that change to take place in the fall. Um, so teachers have the option of attending one session, two sessions, or all three sessions, and we have them over the course of two days. Um, we're also offering in both June and August a Genius Bar. So this is kind of a, um, a drop-in and learn about what you want to learn about. So we surveyed our teachers and um, those who are coming to the Genius Bar have listed all the topics that they want to learn about. And so um, Megan and Ricky will be there to help them learn more about any topic they really use, any program we use, any app we use, any website we use, any resource that we use. 
Um, and then uh, Mrs. Steinmetz is also doing a reading and research session, one for elementary and one for middle school, to go over some of the reading tools and research tools that we have available. So um, especially our daily, the middle school teachers are very excited about that one. And then we're also offering our usual, well, one of our usual uh, professional developments are co-teaching, introduction to co-teaching with Susie Bees from West 40 ROE. Um, that's for all new co-teachers, and so we have a training in the morning, and then in the afternoon, the partner teachers come in and they work together with Susie to start planning for the school year. The other one that we're really excited about is at the middle school, we're going to do some inclusion training for our science and social studies teachers because they have students who are pushing into their classrooms and they are not co-taught all the time. In fact, most often they are not. Um, usually students are pushing in with aids and um, our social studies and science teachers really were asking for some additional training. So we said, you know what, we're gonna offer them the same type of professional development and coaching that we're gonna, that we offer our co-teachers. And so they'll start with Susie. So Susie Bees will also be planning that one. Um, Andrea Mars, our um, extended resource teacher and our resource teachers at the middle school will also be invited to come. And we're going to not only provide them with training, but we're going to provide them with coaching from Susie throughout the school year. So we really wanna beef up their capabilities um, and their resources and the more work we put into that at the onset, the easier it's going to be in upcoming years to support all of our students and their needs. So we're really excited about that one. And when I went and asked them if they wanted to do it, they were all like, why would we say no? <laughs> of course we want to do it. That's great. Um, and then finally, our summer curriculum projects. So um, teachers apply for summer hours to do projects over the summer. And I will say, um, Yes, summer is a great time for learning and work, but it's also been a very challenging and long year and everybody needs a break. So when I sent out the information about all of our trainings and summer work, I had said, you know, if you need to take a break this summer, take a break. There's nothing that is so, so critical that can't wait until we come back in the fall. And of course, um, everybody signed up for everything anyway. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> I tried to keep it to, um, you know, don't go overboard and request too many, like just try to do something that's manageable so that you'll be excited to come back to school in the fall and not feeling burnt out. Um, so we'll complete the technology scope and sequence. Our ELA teachers in 5.8 are working on learning progressions. They've done some work with Kate Roberts um, from Teachers College, and so they're really excited to start working on those. Um, in K4, we'll refresh writer's workshop and ELA scope and sequences. We're gonna do some phonics work. In K2, we have a resource that we're adapting, and so um, we're gonna learn more about that and implement it for the upcoming school year. ELA and social studies alignment in fifth grade, we've worked with um, a really great teacher from Riverside School District named Felicia Burke in the past for social studies, and she's also very well versed in ELA, and so she's going to now work with our fifth grade teachers as well. She's worked with our social studies teachers for several years. Um, building and district SEL work. Um, both IEP teams at both buildings are going to be doing some implementation work. And then um, our IEP team at the elementary is creating a differentiation toolbox that we're really excited about. And then some curriculum work in math, STEM, and STEAM. So we got a lot going on this summer. And I'll end it with more. <laughs> And not learn anything, so nobody can take it away from you. Any questions? This is this is great. I mean, I, I'm sure the teachers have had a really positive response to how customizable it is, too, right? Yeah, and they've liked it a lot. Yeah, yeah lots of I lots of positive. Yeah, so we want to continue that into next year and start building pathways and giving teachers even more choice to focus on pathways. Some must do mm -hmm. because we want to direct some of it, but a lot of it is choice. I had a question about, you mentioned for Schoology that you wanted to move the grades to be found over on Schoology. Yeah. Uh, was there something that was like lacking in Skyward? I just want to make sure yeah. it's easiest for parents to like find all of the grades yeah. at once rather than <laughs> going like. Yeah, Schoology. well the nice thing too is like pretty much like parents are going to have to go into Skyward for grades either if we do this properly. But um, was it four or five before I came here? and we adopted Schoology, the promise was that Schoology and Skyward would connect. So when you did things in the gradebook in Schoology, they would appear in Skyward and everything would be wonderful. And that turned out to not be the case. 
And so for several years, our teachers have kind of been doing double work. They've been working in Schoology and then having to enter grades into Skyward. And so, you know, it was supposed to be a priority for this, well, last school year to figure it out. But of course, again, you know, things went boom. So um, we started really zeroing in on can this be done? How can it be done? So Mr. McAtee and I started doing a lot of research into what do other school districts do? What are the possibilities? We met with Skyward. He's had a lot of contact with uh, people from Schoology. And really the easiest thing to do is to migrate everything over to Schoology and just put final course grades into Skyward. Because Schoology is a learning management system. Skyward is a student information system. And so it makes more sense to be working in that student information or learning management system where teachers can create assignments, they get automatically graded and they go right in the grade book and things like that. So um, so then the CSAW why. grades are the for the elementary school they would still be in Skyward. Yeah, they're okay. still in Skyward. Um, CSAW does have a new feature called um, oh my gosh, what is it called? They have a new feature. Some of our teachers were actually piloting it. Um, it's called oh it's called progress. And so anytime a student finishes an assignment a teacher can pull up their class and see what assignments they've completed or not. It's more for completion, which is a little bit more appropriate for elementary school than grades. Um, teachers still have to grade the work in school and enter it into Skyward, but we'll see what happens. Things change so rapidly, so um, never know. To answer your question, though, Becky, oh. or to continue to answer your question, Jennifer did a great job. The whole purpose of this is to streamline kid communication for everyone, yeah. to make life easier for teachers when they have to enter their grades to make life easier for kids, that they have one plate, or yeah. one stop shop, and the same thing for parents. We want them to have one place that they need to go and not be toggling back and forth, especially for parents who may not be as adept at going to Schoology and then Skyward, you know, like give them one place to go, a one stop shop. So that's really the what we were going for. Yeah, which has actually been a concern that's come up. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, so. I had absolutely. a student the other day who was like, my Skyward doesn't work, my Skyward doesn't work, it hasn't all next year, and I'm gonna have to worry about your Skyward, which is gonna be great. <laughs> Will that save us some money as well, getting rid of Skyward as far as? Well, we're not getting rid of Skyward. We have to have Skyward. We have to, we have, have to have a student information system. So what Skyward does is it takes all of our student information and we use it to do state reporting. Yeah. We uh, use it to okay. uh, manage fees, manage student for It's student information. So like everything about a student is in Skyward. Um, but the real like instructional work should be done in the learning management system. So yeah, no, it won't save us any money. Okay. But it will save us time. <laughs> 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 this is great, That's really. the bright side that we were looking for. <laughs> 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 Any other questions I can answer for you? No. This no, all sounds great, you. though. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds Good job, great. Job, I love the mentor training, and I hope more teachers can get involved with yep. it. We'll, it's we'll been amazing. Bring it back. Yep. We're bringing it back for no. this upcoming school year. So. The other side of the mentor training is uh, there's an analogy yeah. I like to use. So a, a real big focus of the mentor training is leadership training. We want to build leaders. We want to build leaders in our students. We want to build leaders in our staff. And that mentor training, you know, the, the analogy I like to use is when my kids were little, they never eat peas. So I put the peas in their SpaghettiOs and then they ate the peas. We're getting the leadership <laughs> training through the mentor training. So people who want this mentor responsibility are actually getting their peas through their SpaghettiOs <laughs> because um, because they're getting that leadership piece as well as really learning how to beef up instruction and help, help our new teachers to be successful. So, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about that. Yeah, and we just finished our second round of year two mentoring, too. So I do the second year mentoring yeah. um, with all our second year teachers, and they just presented their stretch goals yesterday, and they were all fantastic, and I'm super proud of them. And they they really did, despite the fact that we had they had the craziest second year ever, and they didn't even have a complete first year, they really did some incredible things um, for their students this year. So I'm very proud Thank of them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So let's move on to next month's agenda. Oh, we're right. Middle school schedule. Oh, okay. Did I? Oh. No worries. Okay. Sorry. Um, so, I no, keep cutting people off. <laughs> so during the 2019-2020 school year, the middle school implemented a new 10-period schedule. Tonight, middle school principal Griffin Sontag is here to provide the board with an update on how the new schedule is going and give some reflections on the benefits and lessons learned from the new schedule. <coughs> over to you. All right, good evening, uh, Board of Education members. Thanks for having me um, and providing me the opportunity to speak with you tonight about our middle school schedule. Um, as I begin, and as you saw in the executive summary, um, 
definitely spent quite a bit of time with it going back through the history. Um, so I'm going to go through our slides today relatively quickly about those and then really focus on um, a, a last slide, which is kind of looking forward, looking ahead. But just again, similar to what Dr. Van said, um, thought it was important to start with the history for uh, since we have some new board members. So um, we also uh, began this journey tied to our strategic blueprint. Um, and that action item in human capital said, what's up there, establish building and district schedules, allowing staff the time to have the greatest impact on teaching and learning. Um, and that was on there uh, during my first year, year and a half as the principal. Um, and I kept hearing from the staff a lot about time, a lot just about time. Um, you know, and when we talked about extending the day, you know, maybe that's not the time that we're talking about, but um, we hear a lot about there's not enough time to do everything we want to do. Um, so um, we decided to look at our master schedule and get together with um, a st um, we just basically go through this review process. So we developed and analyzed uh, department and staff priorities. Um, and, and really, that was focused on putting the kids first. So after surveying the staff and convening that committee of teachers, that list of priorities emerged. Um, and that included, and again, this is in your executive summary, but a couple things. Um, classes meeting every day, especially resource and intervention type classes. Additional time, uh, daily time in math. Fifth grade, we kept talking about, keep talking about fifth grade the flexibility to, to support the students um, in their transition, uh, grade level specials being back to back as much as possible, uh, Spanish every day, and then um, this co-planning and curricular planning um, time during the school day, which um, allows teachers at two grade levels uh, to be able to get together during the school day to plan. Um, and I'll talk more about that um, as we continue. Um, from there, we convened the committee, we reported back at staff, and, and went through those steps. And finally, um, we presented to the board in April and May of 2019, um, and sought in June a recommendation for approval uh, for the fall. So then after year one, um, which was the 1920 um, so, uh, school year, um, we came back and we identified uh, positives and unintended consequences and this all happened um, it was interesting we, we kind of really kept the board in the loop and you can go back and, and you know watch these meetings or listen to the meetings um, we met with the board in October um, and talked about these positives and some of these unintended consequences and it was great to be able to really um, you know just two months into school kind of take a step back and say what's working and what isn't working at this point um, and, and talk about it, talk about it here, talk about it with our administrative team. Um, and at that point, a lot of positives with the additional time um, in math in particular daily um, and some of those other things that we talked about, the Spanish every day, they were talking about the kids just, best way to utilize a language and learn it is to, to use it so as often as possible. Um, but we found some unintended consequences and that was interesting too. Um, classes went from 43 minutes to 39 minutes um, if they weren't a double blocked class. And um, so adjustments for PE. They're like 39 minutes to get the kids in, change, come out, take attendance, go across the street to the amazing fields we have, um, play, and then turn around and come back and go in and change. And, um, and so you know there were some unintended consequences there. Um, another one was, was lunch that we talked quite a bit about. Um, because lunch went from 44 minutes down to 40 minutes. Um, and the way that we had lunch set up that first year was um, we had two grade levels um, during each period at lunch. So each grade level got 20 minutes at lunch and 20 minutes outside. And what we found was that um, kids were feeling rushed having to eat lunch in 20 minutes, uh, stand in line, and go from there. So. Um, you know, a lot of positives, but also some things um, that we needed to examine and, and adjust. Um, so we also talked about, um, we surveyed, and um, parents, students, uh, staff members, and had very positive feedback from the survey data. 
And then we had our um, student testing mid-year update in January. And um, you know, it, it wouldn't necessarily make a correlation of this schedule was in this quickly of a time made these scores go up. But um, we definitely saw positive uh, parts. Dr. Bannon had talked about that, as well as um, you know, it, it kind of sounds. I think there's many ways that, that you have schedules. Like there wasn't like a big decrease either, if that makes sense. Like you're always looking to get better, um, but you kind of don't know if this is going to make a positive impact or not. So we saw a little bit of a positive impact, but we weren't ready to say it. it's because of the schedule. Um, so then in February of 2020, we made some recommendations that included more push-in time for Tier 2 uh, interventions within the classrooms, the ability to um, do Tier 3 uh, reading and math interventions um, concurrently, so at the same time. Um, uh, we added online world language this year, um, offering both French and German to our 6th and 7th grade students. Um, and then we blocked our fifth, or well, recommended blocking fifth and uh, fifth grade ELA and social studies, which was also um, Jennifer's uh, PD for this coming summer. Um, and that was that was February um, 2020. We all know kind of what happened in <laughs> March. Um, so there's kind of like this. Yeah, I know. I, I wanted to make it easy. like sirens and lights <laughs> and like. Yeah. So that all happened, and then there's kind of this like, kind of this gap because we did implement these things as best we could, um, but it was kind of a slow rollout because we started the year in a in a half day schedule. We then made an extended half day, and then we got to March 1st, and we went to kind of implementing these um, you know these recommendations. We were doing the world language online and some other, um, and we blocked the ELA social studies. Those things were happening, and so. Now we get to here. Um, and so living and learning with our new schedule uh, discussed the benefits, which consistency of the schedule was one of the largest ones that um, I heard about. And part of that is the daily classes. I mean, uh, really all of our classes right now are daily, um, with the exception because of what we've done through the pandemic was we blocked our science and social studies in seventh and eighth grade meaning they're a double period, not 39, but 78 minutes, um, but they're every other day. And so it's kind of counter to what the priority was, but the 39 minutes, the less transition, um, teachers have found that it's been kind of a, a neat thing that, that was unanticipated. Um, and I'll get to those final um, things in the last slide. The other part of the consistency of the schedule this year that I thought um, worked out really, really well was um, our students stayed, you know, they had the same teachers the whole year. They were in the same classes the whole year. Um, I talked to many principal colleagues in the area, and as things, um, you know, as, as kids came back to school, it messed with their schedule, it messed with their programming, and they had to make adjustments um, and have, in some cases, different teachers for different students or different classes in different parts of the day. Um, we were able to, by during the pandemic, by focusing on our core classes, but keeping our core classes, um, we were able to maintain this consistency of the schedule for the kids. And I think, um, you know, you're gonna you're here about we get lots of emails about learning loss, learning loss, learning loss, and you know we're monitoring that as well. And I really think that here, because of this consistency of the schedule and our kids being you know, the ones that were in person as much as possible, even the ones at home that came back, I, I think we're going to continue to find that for us, the learning loss is not um, nearly as, as impactful as it may have been elsewhere. The fifth grade teachers are teaching only fifth grade, which has been um, wonderful this year, a lot of different reasons. The biggest one is that, so because we're so small, a lot of our teachers um, have to teach multiple grade levels. And so with fifth grade only teaching fifth grade, we've elongated the daily math and the daily science in order to have them teach kind of a similar amount to everybody else. Um, what's also nice, though, is that when they want to have uh, what they call a STEAM day, you know, a, a STEM plus the arts day, um, when they want to do a service project day, they can just do that. And as long as they send the kids to lunch and to specials, they're 
you know, they're kind of self-contained within that group. And that's different. They don't have to worry about, well, I gotta go teach a sixth grade class at this time, so you gotta figure out where to go. They're just here. So um, they've implemented, uh, implemented a home base where they'll meet with the, their first hour class for 20 minutes just to start the day, check in, kind of more elementary, and then start their day and run just a modified schedule. And they're able to do that, which is, um, it's been a great benefit. Um, finally, the collaborative planning time, um, fostering the, the student learning. Um, so Dr. Pelzet talked in his opening that we, we implemented a 10 period day. We used to have a nine period day. Uh, the 10th period really becomes um, a, an additional planning time for the teachers. And it's that period I was talking about before where you have teachers from two grade levels that have planning time at the same time. And we've, we've discussed this through team leader, uh, building leadership team, and just um, through conversations with staff members. And the biggest benefits that they've talked about um, is that the core and special education teachers having that common planning period. Um, for what Dr. Van was talking about before, with the co-teaching, the implementation of uh, science, um, and, and just having, again, back to the original thing I kept hearing as the principal, time. There wasn't enough time. So um, they had the time to do that. Um, implementing, um, co-teaching, differentiating, all of those things uh, have been great. We also, as I mentioned, we have teachers at multiple grade levels. And so oftentimes they're either fifth and sixth or seventh and eighth, and they're teaching the same course. And so to um, have consistency in what they're teaching and the curriculum, they're able to meet together uh, at some point during the week. And then, you know, more, more heads together, it's a better, better process, better system. And so um, they also, this year where that really came in, in terms of that collaborative planning, again, just keep pointing to Dr. Van, uh, but the technology integration and the technology usage. We were able to really increase our technology use um, utilizing the PD um, that was happening. And so, um, you know, I think we, we definitely continue to, to look at is that a, the trade off of dropping the classes, of, you know, four minutes is we get this time where we get to plan together and, and is that trade off um, and benefiting the students. And, and I would say that it definitely is. So um, as we continue, so changes because of the pandemic. This is, this. I mean, I always am looking at things as, you know, here's what's happened, here's the, here's the lemons you've given us, how do we make lemonade, right? So we've got this pandemic, we've done so many different schedules this year, and when we finally were preparing to go back full time, there were a lot of parts that we were like, what's working, what's not working, um, is this an opportunity to make some tweaks and changes? So um, as we're considering going back, um, or as we're going back next year, we're, these, these are still considering ideas. We haven't like officially said these are all the things we're going to implement that are different or tweaks to the schedule. The main parts of the schedule are the same. But here are some things that we've been talking about at our leadership team and, and just need to finalize um, and go from there. So um, with SEL, We've kind of been on, um, I mean, Brandon Malott, our assistant principal, leads the district SEL and our building SEL. Um, and, and we've been on this journey um, with her three years here where we started, um, you know, hearing and seeing that SEL is embedded through many of our lessons throughout the, the times. And it, and it is, and it, and it truly is, and the teachers, I mean, we have documents, I think, that they've updated that, that, that um, you know, show where they've embedded the SEL standards and. Um, and then we, we've gone towards uh, half days in our kind of our, our second year, Miss Malat's second year. Um, and then this year we really, because it's been such a, a different year, we went to more, um, here's the SEL lesson, someone on your grade level teach it, make sure all the kids get it. And it's a much more dis direct instruction of those SEL lessons. Um, and so now where we're heading, is um, once a month next year, we wanna have a school-wide SEL lesson that is um, you know, directly instructed by all of our teachers to all of our students. Um, and I think this is kind of the next step to moving and making sure that, um, I mean, SEL is something that we value greatly. Um, 
and now we're going to really say we do by uh, giving it direct time. And so to do that, we would just run a, a brief modified schedule on that day, like we would for a picture day or something else um, that happens. So uh, that's one. Another one, uh, lunch. So I mentioned before that, that lunch was an issue with the new schedule. We, this year, because of social distancing and other things, we're running four lunch periods instead of two. So now the kids get, um, they get a 40 minute period for lunch, um, whereas we split the kids and half go outside and then half come back in. Um, and so it still seems like 20 minutes, but what we found, well, two things. One, they're not standing in line for lunches at all. The lunches are just being given out quickly. So something we should talk about and consider because that seems to be saving us um, even just a few minutes, but that's enough time where I haven't had anyone concerned about that they don't have enough time to eat lunch. But then secondly, if they do or are, they can just stay in their seat and the group that was outside comes back in and they just sit and have lunch again um, and can stay longer. So it's, it's an interesting thing. Um, we're finalizing the master schedule still and we wanna make sure that it can work. But I really think that this might be, again, one of those things where we weren't expecting it, but we had to do it, and now we're like, oh, we kind of like that. So uh, we've got a, a pretty decent list that we've been we've been going through um, with that. Uh, arrival and dismissal. This will be a quick one. Just, I mean, we've assigned instead of you know everybody really coming in those front doors, we've assigned doors for grade levels, and it's really we've seen a lot of great things with the kids just being separated by grade level. Um, as much as possible, we do that. Um, this was a pretty, seems like a simple one, but something that we hope to continue in the future. Um, no bells. So we shut off the bells because we staggered the hallway times by grade level. So, and that, again, related to COVID, we were only allowed to have a certain number of kids in the, in the halls at the same time. And so we staggered it. And what we're finding is, again, supervision is, is better. Student behavior in the hallways is better. Um, instead of having a, a three minute passing period where you know in the setup of the school and everybody's been on a tour now like you really have to go across the hall you don't need three minutes and so what happens oftentimes is that they go mess around for two and a half minutes and then go to their class and so just by saying you're just going to your next class and if you need to go to the bathroom you leave for a, a minute or two and you come back I mean it it really I mean I think we've, we've seen a lot of positives um, and not using the bells, the teachers just, um, you know, they've got the schedule up on the board. They know when to, when to let the kids out, and, and it, it's, really, um, it's really worked well. Uh, I mentioned the blocked science and social studies. Um, this is something we're considering, and again, it goes against kind of the daily, but I think the, the added benefit of the time as a former science teacher, there's those days where you, you can't get that lab done in 39 minutes. And so, um, I, I envision this will either be a daily block or we'll set the schedule up so that on certain times when the teachers want to block, they can. And we just communicate out with the kids and the, and the families so that they could do um, you know, a simulation in social studies or uh, a lab in science and be able to do that. So we're um, strongly considering that still. And then I also mentioned PE before, um, especially in fifth grade. Um, we, again, we spend so much time with locks and changing and they don't get enough time to move and if they were in fifth grade or even fifth and sixth grade at many of the other schools in our township they wouldn't be changing for PE they're in elementary school and they go outside for PE and play so um, but this it took living it for our PE teachers kind of to look <coughs> at it and say wow why do we do that you know I mean they, they are they're they're little kids they're, they're 10 and 11 at that point when they're arriving um, and it, it is one of the biggest stressors are the locks. Um, so we're, we're talking about not doing locks up in fifth grade in their hallway and then not changing for PE. So um, until they're just a little bit older and a little bit better with their fine motor skills. So um, those are, those are the, the, I mean, they're, they're the big ones for us, but there, there's not a lot of big ones out there in my opinion. I think over the first two years of the schedule, even during the pandemic, we're seeing what, and now we just need to keep doing the same thing for a few more years and collect some data that's gonna support what we're doing. Um, I have just one more slide, it's a quote. I don't want it to seem down, but it's really, I was looking for a quote that 
and, you know, those are the challenges, and now here we go. We're, we're, we're even stronger. <laughs> so I have a uh, very open question, and I would love to hear. I yeah. a quick question. I know um, in previous meetings we had discussed um, when we were talking about changes for the pandemic, locker usage and, like, the advantages of kids having everything in their yeah. backpack and maybe kind of moving away from locker. I just want to see, is that something that you're still evaluating? Is that We are. We're still evaluating it, um, and we're, we're talking about it grade level by grade level. Okay. Um, yeah, it's, it's, backpacks are a funny thing. My first year when I was here, eighth grade, really, as soon as I arrived, they're like, we want to try no, you know, no, like, they gave them lockers, but we want backpacks to travel with the kids. And I was like, all right, like, I've done that at the previous school, like, that's fine. High school, they're going to do it one more year. Um, and then it was like, it, it, the backpacks are too big, they're taking up too much space, and um, it ended up just not really being exactly what they wanted. So, um, yeah, we are talking about it um, for sure at pretty much every grade level right now. And, and the benefit is that the kids have everything with them. Um, and especially those kids that are kind of looking to escape a little bit, they, um, or if they're just disorganized at this point, they, they lack some of the executive functioning, if they don't have it, they have to go to their locker, they miss instruction, and you go from there. Uh, the cons, and I've had a handful of parents reach out this year, is just how heavy the backpacks are. So if we do stick with backpacks um, and either don't assign lockers or assign lockers but have them carry their stuff, um, we would need to be thoughtful about how to lighten those loads. Yeah. You know, I don't want the back injuries and the shoulders and things that I'm hearing about from some parents. Right. I would, just as a parent of a middle schooler, yeah. um, I would love the consideration of maybe using a locker, but maybe just to put your, like I feel like my child does not want to wear his coat to school coat because it's one right. more thing he needs to yeah. shove in a backpack. Yeah. So like maybe just like thinking about using it for like lunches, um, extracurricular. I know some kids now we have sports and maybe they're bringing change of clothes for that. So somewhere to kind of store that extra stuff that they don't need during the day. Yep. No, I think that's a great, I think that's a great idea. Kind of a, a middle of the road. Yeah. So one of our, projects that we're working on this summer um, through the maintenance department is installing locks built into the lockers. And so we won't be sending locks home and losing them and, and not having lockers locked. The lockers will be locked all the time because the, the built-in locks will be on them. No so. backlocking. No more backlocking. <laughs> honestly, <laughs> honestly. Ms. Malad and I deal with backlocking, I mean, so much, and that's where they reverse the lock. Super yeah. schools, people they don't know what backlock yeah. is. Yeah, that's where they you turn the lock around and then lock it. And they got to like get it out the hands <laughs> and do that or use the key. So, other questions? Uh, I do have a question, actually. Yeah. How does the block scheduling, how is it affecting those who have reading and math intervention? Um, so, reading and math intervention occurs during um, when yeah. Spanish is normally. Mm -hmm. So those Spanish classes not blocked because you have Spanish PE um, and uh, the other special uh, art. Well, yeah, the other special um, there. Mm -hmm. So um, those are those are not blocked um, or or never blocked. So the blocking of Spanish or blocking of science and social studies. What it basically does is in seventh and eighth ELA is a block, math is a block already. And then the kids will travel and go to science or social studies or science and social studies or the reverse. Mm -hmm. And so when you block them, you still have your ELA block, your math block, and then you just get science or social studies on that day. Mm -hmm. um, and so intervention is uh, not affected because okay. it happens during the Spanish um, and specials block with mm -hmm. um, PE and lunch. Okay. Yes, yeah, thanks. I don't think I that one. Yeah. Uh, getting back to the blocking, um, wasn't the schedule too like with the, the the math would be up against the science, so they could kind of yes those teachers could work together. So if one needed more time or they wanted to do something with math and science together. Yep. Let me but, explain that. Yeah, I, I just if you're perfect for everybody. Mind. So that is so I've been talking about the blocking in seventh and eighth grade. What you're describing, Mr. Zona, is fifth and sixth grade. Yeah, okay, okay. So we had to, we elongated those times. Right. So they get about an hour of math and about an hour of science. Um, and then the way their block works, after those two hours, then they, the kids switch to um, ELA and social studies. And that's why we're combining them into one. So then they get two hours of ELA social studies. Um, instead of thinking about them as ELA for this long and social studies for this long, we're just looking to 
embed this, the social studies standards within ELA so that we are um, a two hour block of ELA, again, more closely aligned to elementary school where you get more time for reading and writing. Um, and then the science and math is the opposite to make it work. Yeah, thanks for asking about that to clarify for other people. I have two questions. I'm yeah. sorry. Um, first, with the lunches that you mentioned, I know uh, the board received this amazing letter talking about the donations of the lunches, the extra lunches. From, yep. Are you going to continue that next year? We are, okay. absolutely, yeah. And that was, a, that was, I mean, you saw Ivan today and mm -hmm. what he's been doing, but that, that was, those were students that, that come up and the first day we did it, we didn't, we didn't make the donations, we didn't save the food. And the kids were like, why are, why are we throwing away so much food? And I was like, what can we do about it? Like, I know what I could do about it, but what can we do about it? And they said, oh, we, should, we could save it. And so we started by um, saving, you know, and oftentimes it's the, it's the fruits and vegetables, right, in the lunch. They're going to eat the pizza or the uh, hot dog or whatever else is in there, but um, the fruits and vegetables. So we collect it, and as you're describing, Mrs. Walters, um, we first put it in our teacher's lounge. Um, you know, teachers will then take it, and our uh, custodial staff that comes in the evenings will and then, um, and then we make the donations. So we want to do that. We want to start it with as a, a quote unquote shared table, which yeah. is pretty common in schools. Um, but we didn't want, for COVID reasons at the very beginning, we weren't just going to collect it and then give it back to the kids because people have all touched it. So um, I envision it'll turn into a shared table first and then maybe go to the lounge, the teacher's area, and then be donated. So. Uh, we hope that we, I mean, it kind of fits with the, the PEAT team and all of that. We want to utilize everything that we can. Yeah, I think it's great to get back to the community. The same yeah, time, so. yeah. Um, and my second question, and this is kind of like a longer term goal, so kind of um, based on what Arlene just mentioned, the students who are in receiving resources, I know they're missing Spanish class. Right. Them. Is there a way, you know, somewhere down the line we can think about a way that they wouldn't? miss that Spanish class. Speaking as a parent whose um, child did have to miss Spanish, you yeah. know, during the pandemic we were able to come up with innovative ways. Um, uh, Mrs. McPherson was awesome and was able to kind of block him into a different position, like a different schedule, so he was able to actually go to Spanish class, which I think was so innovative and amazing. Yeah. Cool. Um, but I was wondering if maybe down the line, if there's a way we can, if the parents want their child to still attend Spanish class or can work it in, if they could. I mean, I think we can definitely look into it. Um, when, you know, we have, I think that the challenge always is that, like, re so resource is a class that most kids don't have. Right. And so when they don't, it, it, like, basically the question is, what goes in its place? Mm -hmm. Or what do you give in addition to, to other students yeah. so that everybody can have both plus, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, there are some, some creative ideas. Some, some schools have um, a period that's called a, like a win period, like a what I need period, which makes it kind of more, um, more individualized for the students. Um, and sometimes, uh, sometimes what they do there is that, you know, you kind of have your normal schedule with all the periods and they might have resource and other kids might have Spanish, but then during win time, you could work on Spanish because that's a passionate area or some area of interest or and other kids can be working on their passion like uh, coding or, or something else so I can see how things like that could work um, yeah so why don't I'll write it down we'll keep talking about it and see how we can um, how we can I mean it's hard because you want you want everybody to have everything yeah. too and it's just it, it is hard to do all of that well Right. Um, sometimes I've seen where you do like a almost like a Spanish club or you do something else where you expose kids to the language the culture and all of that outside of school mm -hmm. um, and that you know you don't get the credit for it and so forth but for us Spanish I mean most of our kids go into Spanish too after starting in kindergarten and going as far as they go um, so um, but a lot of our kids do just go back to Spanish one when they get to high school and really colleges are looking for two years in most cases of a language. Um, maybe highly selective are looking for four years. Yeah. So even if you don't take it at all, like there are, there are middle schools in the area that don't offer it at all. Sure. And so then you start in high school. But to your point and what I think about as the kids is 
they hear about the Spanish that their friends are learning, or they see the project they had to do, and they're like, how come I don't get to do that? And so you should look into that. Yeah, I think it's a great like, life skill to have also. Oh, for sure. Spanish, so for sure. If they want to take it. So exactly. Like to have that opportunity. So. Something we did when I was in way one is we did the Spanish club during recess and lunchtime. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So that's so like so during Spanish the school experience. day, but right. Yeah. So they're still getting the Spanish. We actually had a French teaching mom come in, and she did French club one day, Spanish club one day. So just to utilize, and they could eat lunch while they're learning. So just another yeah. use of it. Yeah, yeah. And I think I think that all of those things are, are ideas to still do the exposure. Right. If you really have someone who says, "I need to have the class," and they have to be doing everything exactly the same, we. That's where it gets tough because you, I mean, the IEP dictates to the right. team that they got to have the resource time, and it's right. so valuable for the kids when yep. they when they're here in middle school. So, yeah. other questions, please. Um, so yeah, so I have some. So I know when we went into this, um, you know, the precipice was the whole fifth grade transition. So that was that's what we started this conversation. So my question is, I know with COVID, it's not an accurate representation of a traditional fifth grade transition, right. but based on this year since we did start more a normal time like do do you feel like fifth grade transition has been better has the schedule been a, like a beneficial impact to those students like what are your thoughts on that yeah i i do i think it continues to get better okay. um even though things we were prevented to do last year and, and actually we're not going to do this year um like we're not having the kids come over for their tours during the end of the school oh. year um, Are we going to do it over the summer? Yeah, we've scheduled something in you the did summer. You say that, sorry. So, sorry, thank you. Um, okay. And that, that's a little tweak. I think I would like them um, in a typical year to have both. Sure. Um, and try to have them at the middle school as much as possible. Mm -hmm. um, I think the anxiety that's produced with the unknowns and some of that is just mm -hmm. waylaid. Um, other things we weren't able to do this year that, that we were planning was um, we have a talent show at the end of the year. We'd love to have the fourth grade be able to come over. Um, we have a musical that we put on normally in the middle of the year. Love to have the fourth grade come over. I mean, again, just expose them to the building as sure. much as possible. Um, we're still doing our transition articulation meetings. Um, Ms. Malat and I are planning to meet with each of the fourth grade, um, fourth grade classrooms. Sure. So we are doing so many things that I know uh, Dr. Van worked with Ms. Tomei, myself, Ms. Malat, uh, to strengthen this uh, transition. And then I think the schedule with the teachers able to take time out and, and run kind of their own schedule, we didn't get to do that much this year. I mean, full disclosure, because sure. we started in a half day, we moved to a longer half day, and then it's March and, right. and we're going. So, but next year, I mean, they've got plans for this home base to be able to just check in with the kids and and how was your weekend and spend that time and not feel so academically focused right away because they're still little kids they're fifth graders and in any other school again they'd be in elementary school with the same teacher all day long right yeah, but one, one of the things i'm going hit on in this presentation is that we have fifth grade teachers teaching just fifth grade now. right and okay. there's a much more self-contained feel yeah. to mm -hmm. fifth grade than there have been in the past and i think the new schedule allows for that kind of self-contained feel. It feels much more elementary school than it does middle school, junior high, mm -hmm. which I know was a concern in the previous schedule that, mm -hmm. you know, we're taking these kids that in any other, really in any other district in the township would still be in elementary school and we're kind of thrusting them into classes, uh, into a structure for, you know, sixth, seventh, and eighth graders or, you, you know, in 102, mm -hmm. seventh and eighth graders. Mm -hmm. And um, that, that um, ability to uh, have that more self-contained feel I think has helped kids just feel a little bit more comfortable and transition a little bit better. Their four classrooms are literally right next mm -hmm. to each other. I mean they don't really leave a you know seventy five square right. foot area right. over right. the course of the day yeah. until they're going to their art class or right. their PE stuff. or their specials or lunch. So yeah. I think the schedule has allowed for, for some of that too. Got it. Okay. I was also just gonna say with respect to transition, one thing I appreciate is the summer academy. So I have my fourth grade I'll be going into yep. middle school next year and so mm -hmm. I made sure to enroll him in summer academy just so he'll get into this building and hopefully be a little bit more comfortable There's um, a commercial for, next for summer well. <laughs> <laughs> got off the list got it done thank you for that also Mary I think within the last 
two years, we've, um, you know, the staffing we added to the resource. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a dedicated resource teacher to fifth grade now. Okay. Um, okay. Two years ago, we implemented that. Um, and the person in the position was there for a year, and then we have a, a new person in the position. Um, so that will just build uh, as well. And I think that, that is really key. We used to split between fifth and sixth grade. Um, and that mm -hmm. was challenging to manage the two grade levels. Question, so will that resource teacher in fifth grade move with their kids? Because that won't. could be a detriment as a spec teacher to, you know, yeah, as much as, I'm just. The plan at this point is not to. The plan right now, because of um, the, the way our co-teaching is working and our relationship pairs between our, mm -hmm. our teachers, uh, we're, we're planning to leave our special ed teacher at fifth grade and we have our sixth grade teacher who next year will be starting her third year. Uh, okay. So she's been co-teaching um, with the same math teacher for two years and she switched to ELA teachers um, this year. So um, this will be her second year with that new ELA teacher. And then in seventh grade, will I have a different special resource teacher and then eighth grade a different resource teacher? Yes. So all four years they have a different they have special a different, education different teacher. resource teacher. That's interesting. Yeah. What do you think about that? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think there's... As a special education teacher, I'm yeah. totally opposed to that. But yeah. Yeah, I'm just curious. I never really yeah. thought about yeah, that. Yeah, I'm totally opposed. So right. I think you've got to kind of pick your poison, right? Mm -hmm. So if, if co-teaching so is uh, uh, a model that we value, which we do, uh, you know, one of actually, if the special education um, director interviews, one of the candidates said, it's a marriage, right? You build a marriage between the, the general education teacher and the co-teacher, sure. and that takes time. It doesn't happen quickly, and we've really um, had to kind of fiddle with the partnerships in order to get partnerships that really work. I think if you're constantly looping and changing those, um, you you never really are, are building that chemistry, that, that kind of... Um, uh, symbiotic kind of relationship between the pairs. Mm -hmm. So, again, if, if our if our goal is to have a really robust co-teaching model, I think have working on the relationship between those pairs, and then also working with our teachers and special education teachers and general education teachers to really build those relationships with kids and families is important as well. I know as a parent, my child had a different uh, case manager each year, um, and it, there was some adjustment period, right? But at the end of the day. <coughs> the services themselves were so robust and so good and the co-teaching model worked so well that um, uh, that it worked really well for, for our family and I, I think that we're doing that too. I think we're, we're, we're getting to that point as well. So, I, I like the co-teaching model of that, but I think at the elementary school, any co-teacher team did last year over year. If that makes sense. Yeah. So it's like at that point, we had a few, we had a few, but not all of them. You're right. Oh, well, okay. you're right. That's we did have to make. And so again, that's like, where some of those tweaks and not on purpose, of course. In. I know, right. but like circumstances of a lot of things. But right. I, I, mean, I think the the looping model, I think, would be interesting for for resource kids because yeah. they they create bonds. Well, with luckily right. we them, have, and then they're, they're the ones who new director who can look into that. Yeah. Let's just let's get started. Come on, hit the ground running. First, have yourself in. I mean, I think it's a, it's a good, it's a good idea, and one that we've, I mean, we've talked about it. It's conscious when you think about mm -hmm. what are you choosing that looping relationship that might be two years or might be four years, and the co-teaching pairs as the content gets more rigorous in sixth, seventh, and eighth in particular. Um, you know, the, I mean, my first year was the first year we started co-teaching, and it, I mean, a lot of in, in many of the classrooms. The special education teachers just I mean they hadn't been exposed to that content mm -hmm. in a while so they really they found their symbiosis uh, in a little different way because in, in certain cases they didn't know the content as well as as a, a you know a, a content specialist teacher with a degree in math for the you know the eighth grade level so yeah I mean to Dr. Pelzet's point it's it's definitely a, kind of an either or. You've got to decide for your own district what is it, and happy to to look into that with, um, with Ms. Parker. Yeah, just I just didn't really realize that till right now. So and I think we do that at the elementary as well, right? Yep. I mean, they tend to stay with those same partners. So that's, I mean, okay. yeah, that's just okay. I think that's what we've chosen to do at this point. Um, I just had a question. So um, about the, the fifth grade only teachers, that, with the success of that, 
was there any uh, thought of bringing it to other grades as well, or is it just that it's like seventh and eighth are too similar, or there's maybe there's a capacity issue with teachers or whatever the case may be? But yeah. Um, so are you talking a, like if all the teachers would be the same for in, six? In theory, so essentially like a fifth grade team, a yeah, sixth grade like, team, a seventh grade if, team. If there, was, if there was success doing it, so maybe that that's that, another model. That is the dream. Yeah, yeah, that would be the dream. Um, I just think that too many teachers. Yeah, it, we would have to add multiple. I mean, we added in order to implement this whole schedule, we added one teacher uh, to make that work. And I think, I mean, I would have to look at it. But what we've done to create the master schedule that we do is we take the people who can and and, and want and whatever and would be best at teaching these different things and put those puzzle pieces in. And so, um, you know, I think of like a Mr. Madsen, uh, social studies, who teaches two in sixth grade and four. Um, in seventh grade, and so if he was on one team, what would he be teaching, and how many teachers would we need, and what's he endorsed in to be able to teach those things sure. to make it all fit? Um, yeah, that's the dream. I think when we put this whole schedule thing together, um, we will also, I mean, one of those parameters that's always out there is how much more staff is it going to cost, which is going to impact the budget. Sure. So um, the dream would be to have each grade level have their own team. So um, yeah. If, we can we can definitely look into that too and come back with you to all of you and say here's how many teachers it would be here's how that would impact we have run some really preliminary sure. analysis and it, it is pretty expensive to do yeah. something oh, like that yeah. but yeah. Um, and, and i give credit to griffin and his team for really figuring out how to schedule like middle school scheduling is either something you absolutely love or something you absolutely hate and luckily we have a principal who loves it so <laughs> he is able i mean this year i think he's created at least like nine schedules for the middle school as we've gone through the year but um, he's done a really nice job at kind of either finding like he, he explained Mr. Madsen who does fifth, or I'm sorry sixth and seventh he's really adept at that right he's, he's done that for a while he not, understands the curriculum and, and Griffin does a really nice job at keeping people in their wheelhouse and doing the things that they're good at um, and minimizing some of those um, difficult transitions for our staff um, so I think you're right, it's the dream, but I think we've made it, what we have, the absolute, one of the best it can be. Yeah, it, ba it balances. It balances what they're, what they're certified in, endorsed and licensed in, um, what they're passionate about. Like I said, um, I've, I've, I've been in schools where you, you made it fit based on what you have. Um, like I have a uh, language arts endorsement. Um, I've never taught language arts. Uh, it was because I went to a liberal arts college. Um, could I do it? Sure, <laughs> but it wouldn't be my cup of tea. Like I was a science teacher who taught some math, and that really worked for me. So I've seen schools where they've made the the teaming fit because teaming, kind of back to Mary's question before, teaming is more most important. So we're going to make Mr. Matson teach, you know, four social studies and a block of ELA. Well, he he doesn't know the ELA. He's never taught it. He doesn't really like it, quite honestly. I mean, I'm just saying that. Sure. And, and we could make it fit better, but that's where you balance the, so asking the teachers, you know, knowing what they're endorsed in, and then asking them, what, what's your passion? What do you want to teach? Because we all know if we're in that, that wheelhouse spot that Dr. Pozet said, we're going to give our all, and we're really going to make a difference with the kids. So again, that's a great question. I really, I mean, I appreciate that question that we've done it for fifth. Um, you know, maybe fifth and sixth would be the way to go and make that work. Um, as a kind of in between, mm -hmm. seventh and eighth, I think um, I think we're in a really good spot with where we're at. Sure. Well, that's a transition high school. Yeah, right. You know, it's a more high school type. Right. So fifth, yeah. sixth, like I in my head have is like the well, liberal arts guys, and then seventh, eighth grade is more like we're getting them ready for high school. Yeah. Like, well, yeah, and I'm not signing up the resource teacher to rotate, but <laughs> but maybe a fifth to sixth loop would be interesting <laughs> too. Mm -hmm. uh, kind right. of a mini transition right. for a couple right. of years, give the, those resource kids that same teacher, that same connection, and parents, right. that same consistency. That's, I mean, I, I think what you're hearing, and especially the new board members who we haven't had to address, like, we're always looking to get better. Right. And that's the cool part about, I mean, we don't think we can sit in our offices and design the best thing. We want to throw it out here and, and see what the ideas are and then bounce those and, and see what's going to be best for kids. That's what it has to come back to. It has to come back to what's going to make the greatest impact on the kids' learning. So. Other questions? 
Um, I just have the last one, sorry, right. not special no. ed related. Um, were we going to do like an end of the year survey feedback on the schedule or no, probably not because we only did it for a couple months? Because I know we talked a lot about survey data to see. Yeah, we did survey going. data after the first year, well, yeah. first half a year or so yeah. of implementing and then again the pandemic hit. Right. Um, I, we weren't planning to do it this year, but right. I, would, I would be very open to doing it the following year and kind of. Sure. People may not even know there was an old schedule at that point, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but how's the schedule is going to be like before COVID. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Because um, right. that was one of the questions right. that we asked, and we got some ideas to, to make it better. We heard about lunch from yeah. more than just the few people that reached out. So. Okay. And that was mostly positive feedback. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I don't think I can do the afternoon. No. Because I have the kids in the afternoon. Mom, like, you could do more. Do the morning. Charles, have you been through it before? Yeah. Do I? Yeah, I have to go. Though. Yeah. yeah. You have to go. <laughs> <laughs> Please go. <laughs> it makes everyone's life easier if you go. I'm sure there's a lot of new material. So it sounds like we're kind of an agreement on June 25th, right. uh, the 9 to noon. Okay. And I'll confirm that, and that'll be our date. Thank you. Thanks for facilitating sure. that, Erica. Thank you. Yeah. And it'll be here. They, they come to us. It'll be here in the boardroom. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're going to move on to reviewing the school board uh, section 2 board policy. Yep. So each month the board reviews policy to ensure the policies reflect the realities of leading a school district. This month the board is reviewing section 2 school board. I did have two board members reach out to me with some corrections, and those corrections are um, at your seat. Um, the first one uh, is just the order that they're in, not necessarily numerical order. Um, the 2 colon 150, um, we made some adjustments to this one to reflect our current practices. As you know, we get our policy from press and we generally adopt directly from press. Um, but press is, a, it's general, right? It doesn't necessarily um, uh, pick up some of the nuances of different boards. This one was pretty general. We have superintendent advisory teams not necessarily board committees. So we changed some of that language. Um, a board member did reach out to me and, and wanted to make sure that we kept that word establish and support in there. And then um, and then just added a little bit of language, again, that because of the uniqueness of having superintendent advisory teams. Um, I did also have a board member reach out. And, and this was actually a great catch, because um, 2 colon 150 and 2 colon 110 um, kind of work together in some ways. This is about the officers and specifically around the board president that, um, again, adding that, that superintendent advisory team language. And then also, because we have superintendent advisory teams um, and there are only two board members on there, we're not necessarily beholden to some of the own, um, Open Meetings Act regulations. However, number four said that the president can uh, attend and observe all board meetings. Well, if there are, I'm sorry, all committee meetings or superintendent advisory team meetings. If that were to happen, then we'd be in violation of the Open Meetings Act because there'd be three board members there. So we just added in less a violation of the Open Meetings Act, just to clarify that, which again is aligned with the first one that we read, two polling members. So just wanted to explain those changes. Really good, really good catches, really good changes. I had a question for the um, 2.150 uh -huh. committees and superintendent advisory teams. Um, I already talked about the established, but just for consistency um, purposes, the first paragraph when it talks about the president um, makes all um, board committee and superintendent advisory team appointments subject to board approval, mm -hmm. right? I think that language should be mirrored in the uh, final paragraph. And it says the board president will appoint no more than two board members to serve on each superintendent's advisory team, also subject to board approval, just so it mirrors the same language as in the first paragraph. That's my suggestion. Board, 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 I mean, it's fine with me. It can read either way. Oh. Um, I don't have a strong opinion. I mean, we are. Yeah, I mean, our process is pretty, pretty informal, right? Like we have our yeah. committees. We say we want well, to serve. Well, we were volunteers. It's not you're not yeah. really appointed. Correct. Yeah. Correct. I mean, the the president in the past has led that conversation. Okay, guys, we've got three yeah. committees. Right. Who wants to do what? Charles, you want to be on finance? Great. You're fine. You know, yeah. stuff like that. Right. Um, so I guess you could call that an appointment. You know, a board appointment, board president appointment, or okay. but it really is is more informal. I mean, mm -hmm. whether we want to add that to the policy or not, it's six or one half a dozen of the other for me. I but it's your there these are your policies, not necessarily right. mine. Yeah. Um, I mean I'm a, does anybody else have any concerns or are you okay with um, this language being Well I think what I think something. what Becky is saying is that if you read this pair, like last sentence here, we're saying that all board committee and superintendent advisory team appointments are subject to board approval, but down here, we're in. so I think we just need to make the decision and be consistent in the top paragraph. So, like, what does that mean? Right. Right. If someone yeah. is going to volunteer, the board has to 
approve it? I think it's usually, Erica, isn't it usually? Yeah, we don't usually formally approve it. Is that with part a of vote. Like a consent agenda? Mm -hmm. No. Oh, it's, it's just, just an essentially about it's self selection. So, would this need yeah. to be if we added that language, would we have to move it to a consent agenda? Not necessarily. I mean, we can keep doing what we've been doing. I mean, the, the, where, where I see this, where I see this maybe coming into play is if we had, we have two board members on each mm -hmm. superintendent advisory committee. If we had four board members that wanted to be on the same superintendent advisory committee, right. then that may be put, you know, sure. the president can decide, I'm going to appoint or I'm going to, it's going to go to a board oh. vote. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's where I see it as kind of being the tiebreaker type of mm -hmm. situation. Um, I don't know if you guys see any other scenarios where that may apply. Well, I guess you could see there could be a point where, where the same people get appointed to all the committees. True. I mean, generally yeah. what we've tried to do is get everybody on. Right. I know, I know, but or to Becky's point, point. Mm -hmm. and that would be Oh, I see what you're saying. That it, 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 it makes sure that, like, Bill doesn't join every single superintendent, by, like, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Yeah, exactly. So we'll go ahead and... Okay, so okay. make sure that it mirrors that language. Yeah. Okay. 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 We'll fix that. Okay. Good catch. Thanks. Okay. Right. okay. Now we can... Now, I guess. Okay. <laughs> Let's go on to reviewing next month's agenda. Okay, so we've got spring testing report, board self-evaluation, approved consolidated district plan, approved transportation contract, approved school board section two board policies, class size update, and uh, are we adding the settlement agreement? Yeah, that'll go into, yeah, that'll, that'll go, go into that consent. Yeah, okay, okay, all right. And there are no other items to be added? Oh, were we going to do, um, no, never mind. Okay. I just, at, for the end of the year, I didn't know if there was something else we needed to add. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's so all good. Okay. Yes. So we'll go ahead and move to item nine, open forum. Um, please know that all individuals addressing the board will be afforded three minutes. We will also limit to 15 minutes on any one topic. And we'll take the green forms in the order they came. The green forms are out in the hallway. If you have any questions, we will acknowledge all who have completed the green forms in the minutes of this meeting. Any questions addressed to the board will be answered by the administration within 48 hours. Additionally, for clarification and to ensure that your specific questions are answered, we request that the questions be submitted in writing on the green forms on the table outside the board room. Um, is there anybody who would like to address the board at this time? Okay. So, I'm gonna go ahead and turn to close. Closed closed session. Session. Okay, so let's go ahead and move into closed session. Um, that the Board of Education moves into closed session at 737 to discuss matters relating to the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees of the district or legal counsel for the district, including hearing testimony on a complaint lodged against an employee or against legal counsel for the district to determine its validity. So can I get a motion? So moved. Can I get a second? Second. Is that Becky? No, thank you. <clears throat> Mrs. Lenzen? Yes. Mrs. Marchion? Yes. Mrs. Walter? Yes. Mr. Zona? Yes. Mr. Bracco? Yes. Mrs. Cabana? Yes. Okay, so we are now in closed session and